In this video, we'll be talking about cell structures and processes. It's part of A2.2 on cell structure, and this is part of the standard level or core content. So the theme of this whole unit is unity and diversity. So it's important to keep an eye on those big thematic pictures, right? So we know that living things are very diverse, they're very different, but there are some things that they have in common and that really plays to this unity theme. So all cells are going to have a plasma membrane that's going to go around the outside. Um, we'll talk lots more about that another time, but it's a semi-permeable uh, layer made out of phospholipids. All cells are going to include cytoplasm. It's a watery based solution um, where all of the metabolic reactions are going to occur. And all organisms have DNA as their genetic material. Now, some of you will end up studying viruses later on. Viruses can sometimes use RNA as their genetic material, but it's important to note that viruses are not considered to be living things. Um, there are some functions of life that they can't perform. So we can safely say that all living organisms use DNA as their genetic material. Organisms can be classified in lots of different ways, but all cells are going to fall into two basic categories. They are either prokaryotic cells, which we will talk about right now, or eukaryotic cells, which we will talk about in just a moment. This picture is a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotes I often um, think about as bacteria, so we'll kind of go into that in just a bit. but. Prokaryotes in general are much simpler in their structure. They are smaller. They're generally less than 10 micrometers, and they evolved first. They were the first types of cells to evolve. They're also ubiquitous, which means that they are found in every different biome and habitat um, on Earth. Prokaryotes in their general structure are going to lack a nucleus, so they're not going to have their DNA surrounded by a membrane. They do have DNA, it's just not surrounded by a nuclear membrane. All prokaryotes have a cell wall on the outside, it's made of different things, but they do have a cell wall and they are what we call non-compartmentalized. That means that they are going to lack some of the organelles or cell structures that we will find in eukaryotic cells. Now we will see these little dots here. Um, these dots are um, structures that help to synthesize proteins, and those are ribosomes. In prokaryotes, those are specifically referred to 70S ribosomes, S is a unit of size, okay? So um, we'll kind of expand upon that in just a moment, but they have a particular size to their ribosomes and prokaryotes um, are uniquely 70S. And their DNA, which we mentioned here is not enclosed in a nucleus, is sometimes referred to as naked DNA. I don't love that term. Um, that just means that DNA in prokaryotes is not associated with what we call histone proteins. So in eukaryotes, DNA is wrapped around little sets of proteins called histone proteins, and they help do a lot of different things, okay? But in prokaryotes, they don't have histone proteins, okay? So we won't find that structure. They just have the naked DNA. And here in this diagram of a eukaryotic cell, it's much easier to see now what we mean by this term compartmentalized. So compartmentalized means we're going to have membrane bound organelles and they're going to be separated from the rest of the environment um, of the cell. And so in their tiny compartment, they're doing a specialized job. Some eukaryotic cells like plants or fungi have a cell wall, but not all of them. Like prokaryotes all have a cell wall and eukaryotes only some of them. There are some things that eukaryotes have that are lacking in prokaryotes. One of the main features is their nucleus. So this is the nucleus of this eukaryotic cell. And inside of the nucleus, we would expect to find all of that organism's DNA. 
The nucleus itself is a double membrane and it's got small holes called pores. We'll talk more about the nucleus in a minute. Um, but that uh, nuclear membrane is very characteristic of eukaryotes. Inside of the nucleus is the, the DNA. Sometimes it's in the form of chromosomes. Um, and that DNA is associated with histone proteins. So in eukaryotes, that DNA is going to be wrapped around things called histone proteins. And again, we don't find those in prokaryotic cells. In eukaryotes, we're also going to find ribosomes, but they are not 70S ribosomes. Like in prokaryotes, they have a different size. These are 80S ribosomes, they're a bit larger. And all eukaryotes are going to have mitochondria. So I see a mitochondria here. Some eukaryotes will also have some other structures, like a chloroplast or maybe an endoplasmic reticulum, but not all of them. So it's important to note what is characteristic to all eukaryotes. And for that, we want to be thinking mitochondria. Theme A is all about unity and diversity. And we've talked a lot about how cells are different, but there are ways in which they are the same. And so there are certain processes of life that are going to be common to all organisms. And this is in use unicellular organisms. That just means that that one cell has to do all these things, but multicellular organisms do these as well. And I like to remember the mnemonic Mr. Shang because it helps me to remember them all, right? So the first one here is metabolism. Metabolism is all of the enzyme catalyzed reactions in the cell. Now that's closely related to nutrition. Nutrition is getting the nutrients required. Metabolism is doing stuff with those nutrients and excretion is the removal of waste products left over from that metabolic process. So those are kind of related. Um, all living things are going to grow that means increasing in either size, if you're multicellular or unicellular, like so increasing in that size of that one cell, or adding on new cells if you're multicellular. So all of the things are going to grow and they're going to reproduce, whether that's sexually or asexually, that can look very different, but production of offspring is also common to all living things. Now, all living things must um, maintain homeostasis. And homeostasis is a living organism's ability to regulate the inside conditions to keep them stable and within narrow limits, regardless of what's happening in the outside environment. And that has to do with sensitivity, right? So living things are going to be able to react to stimuli in their environment with various responses. So some of those responses are going to be internal in order to help maintain homeostasis. Some of them will be external. It doesn't necessarily mean moving. It can mean lots of different things. But again, these are what we want to think of that all living things have in common, um, what makes unity amongst the various life forms. In unicellular organisms, those are organisms made up of only one cell. Um, that one cell has to do all of those different functions. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. In multicellular organisms, that's you and me, we're made up of many cells, we have different cells to carry out different functions. So those cells start to specialize and some cells might be really good at responding. Other cells might be much better at homeostasis. So different cells to perform different functions of life. Now, in unicellular organisms, I need to be looking for parts within that single cell that can do all of those functions. And paramecium and chlamydomonas are great examples of this. So let's talk about this paramecium first. I see these tiny little hair-like projections on the outside. These are called cilia, and they are there for movement. So a great way for this cell to maybe respond to a stimulus in its environment and either move towards or away from something. I'm seeing these crazy star-shaped uh, bits here. These are something called a contractile vacuole. Contractile vacuoles are going to help that organism remove excess water. And that's a great example of performing homeostasis. 
I'm also going to see tiny little food vacuoles. So a food vacuole is uh, an enclosure that is going to kind of hold food that that organism has ingested. What else are we seeing here? I'm also seeing cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is going to be that watery based substance where all the metabolic reactions can occur. And I see a nucleus. So the nucleus is right here. And of course the nucleus is going to um, house all of that DNA, which would be necessary for reproduction when this cell is ready to reproduce. So again, lots of different features um, performing all of those functions of life. Chlamydomonas is a little bit of a different organism, but it still has features to help it accomplish all of those functions. These whip-like projections, these are called flagella. And just like the cilia, they are also there for movement. Um, this chlamydomonas also has a nucleus, it's right here. And it has a really big chloroplast. So the chloroplast is this um, like cup shaped green thing here. And this is going to help this organism with its nutrition. So whereas the paramecium is ingesting food, the chlamydomonas is manufacturing its own carbohydrates through photosynthesis. I'm also going to see a contractile vacuole here which again helps this organism maintain homeostasis and proper solute levels. And it's also going to have this really cool eye spot. Okay, these are really good. If you look at these underneath the microscope, you'll be able to see these. And this eye spot is going to help this organism sense light and then move towards that light so that it can maximize its photosynthesis opportunities. Um, so again, a different structure um, helping it to respond to that environment. So let's synthesize some of this information, right? Unity and diversity, how are things different? How are they the same? Um, when we think about plastids, plastids are going to be things like a chloroplast. So that's one example. I'm going to find those in plants only. So I won't find them in fungi and I won't find them in animals. Cell walls are features that are common to fungi and plants, but animals do not have a cell wall. Now, the cell walls of fungi and plants are made of different materials, but the structure does exist in both of them. We will also find a structure called a vacuole in both plants and fungi. In animal cells, these are either teeny tiny or they are absent. So I typically don't associate uh, vacuoles with animal cells. Centrioles, on the other hand, are present in animal cells. We'll talk about those later on in this section, but centrioles are going to help move things around during cell division, and we don't see those in fungi or plants. So if you're looking at a micrograph and you see centrioles, you should be thinking animal cells. All right, this undulipodia, um, what is that? So I like to focus in on this word pod or pod, it means foot. So these are things that are going to help with movement. So these are things like the cilia or the flagella. And we looked at those in both that paramecium and the chlamydomonas, but here we're not talking about unicellular organisms. Animals, plants, and fungi are mostly gonna be uh, multicellular, okay? Um, and I wanna be associating those with animal cells. So we won't find any of those um, you know, movement type structures on fungi or plants. Now, unlike physics or chemistry and biology, when we have a rule, there's always an exception. So remember back when we were talking about the cell theory, we said that part of that was um, a statement that says all organisms are made of one or more cells. Cells are supposed to be units that are clearly separated and have one nucleus. And that's the case for most cells in most organisms but there are some exceptions that you should know. So we need to know both the exception and why it is an exception. So red blood cells in humans, um, you've probably seen those before, they look like normal cells, but they don't have a nucleus. So there's no nucleus in those cells, there's actually no DNA in those cells. 
In plants, we're going to have something called a phloem sieve tube element. So it's part of the phloem, part of the transport mechanism for plants. And those cells are, are kind of sitting there, but all of their cytoplasm and their nucleus has been removed. They rely on neighboring cells called companion cells to help them do all the things. So that's a weird one. Skeletal muscle, it looks like this. Um, skeletal muscle is made up of very long cells, and these cells are what we call multinucleated. So a single cell is going to have many nuclei. So there's our ex exception for having one nucleus. And the last one is really fun. So these are called aseptate fungi. So your septum, okay, is like this part here on your nose. It means to separate. A septate would mean no separation. So instead of having clearly defined cells that are separated from their neighbor, these cells lack a division. They lack a cell wall, okay? And so again, a great uh, illustration of an example um, that is an exception to the cell theory. One of the more difficult tasks we have as biology students is to look at these pictures. These are called micrographs, and they come from electron microscopes. And we have to know what it is that we are looking at. And often, we're asked to identify what type of cell is in this micrograph. So there are a couple of tips that I can give you for figuring out what type of cell it is that we're looking at. This is a prokaryotic cell. There are a couple of things that tell me that this is a prokaryotic cell, one of which is its shape. Most prokaryotes are going to be either a rod shape, a round shape, or a spiral shape. So in this case, I'm looking at the bacillus or rod shape of a bacteria. The other thing that I would want to look at is the size. So there's no size on this micrograph, but in general, um, these are going to be less than 10 micrometers. So they're kind of small. Now, if we can't see a size, what are some other things that we can point out? Well, I want to look for this DNA. All right, so this is kind of hard to see if I do it in black, but here's the DNA. I'll redraw that maybe in yellow. This darkened area in here, this is all of that DNA. And you can see it's just kind of like hanging out here in the middle. It's not enclosed in that more rounded nucleus structure. I can also see some ribosomes. Now that's not terribly helpful on its own because um, other types of cells have ribosomes. So we'll just kind of leave that be. It's more about what I'm not seeing. I don't see any of those membrane bound organelles, okay? I don't see any evidence of compartmentalization. And this is telling me that I'm looking at a prokaryotic cell. Next, let's look at plant cells. And I'll tell you what is not going to be the case. You won't get a picture of a green plant cell. So again, electron micrographs are in black and white um, unless they are falsely colored or put through the, some of those fluorescent dyes. So we can't rely on color. Um, I wanna be looking for a couple of things here with these plant cells. So the first thing that I kind of notice when I'm looking at this plant cell is it has more of a geometrical shape to it. Um, it's not a blob, it's like a rigid shape. And that is due to the presence of this cell wall. So that's a great kind of visual cue. The biggest thing I tend to look for is this structure right in here. It's called the large central vacuole. The central vacuole stores mainly water and plants tend to blow this up with water to pressurize their cells for support. So on a microscope or in a micrograph, it's going to take up a large portion of the cell. Look for that vacuole. Um, another feature that I would want to look for is the chloroplast. So chloroplasts are going to be kind of like bigger structures. We'll look at those in more detail soon, but I should also notice in these chloroplasts, maybe some darkened discs or spots. Those are dead giveaways that I'm looking at a chloroplast. And if I'm looking at a chloroplast, it's a plant cell. 
Um, another thing that's good to find, although it's not necessarily a distinguishing feature, is the nucleus. So the nucleus is right here. It's usually kind of like rounded in shape. It's filled with this like uh, genetic material. So genetic material tends to show up a little bit darker. Um, and then I also usually see a spot in here called the nucleolus. But this is a really typical picture of a nucleus. Like I said, we won't find that in prokaryotes, um, so that's helpful, but we will find it in animal cells, so um, just have that in mind. Same thing here with the mitochondria. Again, if I had to decide what I'm looking for in terms of a plant cell, I wanna be looking for three things. I wanna look for the shape, I want to look for this large central vacuole, and I wanna to try to look out for chloroplasts. Animal cells are a little bit tougher, so they're not going to have a cell wall, okay? So their shape is going to be maybe a little bit more of a blobby type shape, but we have to be careful about saying that because I'm also going to have some animal cells that look like this, and I'm also going to have some animal cells that look like long, skinny, crazy things, okay? So relying on a rounded shape is a not a great idea, but at least thinking about the absence of the cell wall, and so it won't be just a rigid geometric shape. Um, other things I won't see, I'm not going to see a large central vacuole, I'm not going to see chloroplasts. I should be able to, again, find this nucleus, okay? Um, and that tells me that it's a eukaryotic cell. From then on out, what I'm doing to identify this as an animal cell is I'm eliminating it as possibly being a plant cell. No uh, vacuole, no chloroplast. So hopefully that helps you identify some of these cells in micrographs.